This is Daniel. Uh, he's going to talk to us about beating games. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of um, personal context. So uh, I have, since uh, maybe high school or early college, I can't remember exactly when, but I love this game called Go. It's an ancient uh, um, oriental board game. Uh, and I've been playing it forever. It's existed for like 3,000 years, okay? Uh, and until very recently, computers were absolute trash at this game. Um, to the point that, like, if you, uh, if you really wanted to, you could probably study Go for a year-ish while keeping your full-time job and be able to beat any existing AI. Um, and then... Uh, I was looking up exactly when it happened and depressing myself about how long ago it was. Uh, maybe five years ago, okay? Uh, DeepMind am announced that uh, they were going to have this competition between their AI and the very top player in the world at Go, we say Go. Um, <clears throat> okay, some people got upset and said, well, he's not the very best. Uh, you should pick this guy. He's the very best. You should pick that guy. He's the very best. Everyone agreed he's top five, maybe top ten, something like that, okay? Uh, and they announced they're going to have this competition, and everybody was speculating, oh, it's going to be an absolute nightmare for the AI, and then there's other people saying, oh, it's going to be, why would they organize this whole thing with a million-dollar prize pool if they weren't absolutely sure? And it was, nobody really knew what was going to happen. It was very exciting, uh, and... Um, long story short, the computer absolutely trounced uh, Lee Sedol, and this blew the, the uh, Go world open. They were super excited about it. Um, China immediately announced a like $2 billion budget for doing research into how the heck DeepMind had done this. Um, uh, it, was, it was wild and exciting, and I really wanted to learn uh, how that thing worked. So... Um, but I never really uh, had much time to do that. And so uh, it wasn't until maybe a couple months ago that I finally uh, got the time to sit down and do it. And this talk is going to be about what I learned. Um, and uh, AlphaGo, um, it is in the sort of uh, the modern style of AI development. And so I was a little bit nervous when I started studying it because uh, for me, there's like this gut reaction to the modern style of AI, which is like, oh, well, nobody really knows how it works or what it does. They just threw like 10 billion CPU hour, G GPU hours at it for training uh, an enormous neural net and uh, like, why did they pick the size of neural net they did? Nobody knows. They like tried 10 and one of them worked well and they kept with that. And like there's all these things that are just sort of uh, not computer science in there that are like computer art. Uh, and so part of the goal of this talk is to convince you that there is a very interesting core algorithm that is solid computer science uh, that, that has you know, good reasoning for all the decisions in it and like LaTeX proofs and all of that good stuff. Okay? Um, so, to get there, um, before we can get there, I have to tell you like in detail what is the problem that we are trying to solve. Uh, and I'm going to do that by way of actually not an algorithm that's in AlphaGo at all called Minimax. Um, because Minimax is uh, simple and small and easy to understand. And then we will build from there uh, into more complicated and better stuff. Okay? So uh, we're going to talk about Minimax. Uh, we're going to talk about what would happen if it didn't completely suck. Uh, and then we're going to take a little detour that's not going to seem related immediately, but I promise it will be eventually, about how to win at Vegas. Uh, and we'll talk about... Uh, there's some jargon here that we can't understand yet, uh, but I will explain it when we get there. Okay. Oh, I'm so nervous. My heart is beating like crazy. Okay, here we go. So, uh, at this moment uh, in a traditional talk is where you have, uh, they stop and like ask the audience how much they know about the thing they're about to talk about. 
And I really wanted to have that audience interaction, but even after thinking about it for a long time, I couldn't think of any questions that I wanted to ask that would actually change what I was going to say. So, we're going to do a farce. We're going to do it anyway. Uh, and here's how it's going to work. I would like all of you to put your hands up. Just everybody wave your hand in the air. Very good, very good. Can I have about half of you put your hand down? Yeah, good. Maybe a third of what's left to put your hand down. And uh, now, if you think, look around, if you think you might be the guy that knows more about Minimax than the other guy that still has his hand up, keep your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> lovely, lovely. So we got one person at the end. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, yes. Uh, okay, so here's the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, we are sitting in the space of solving games. So what is a game? Uh, I have drawn a pictorial dis uh, depiction of a game uh, on a whiteboard and taken a picture of it and then reproduced that picture on a screen. It's like incredibly many levels deep, but here we go. Uh, the basic idea is like, uh, it's a tree, okay? And uh, at each of the nodes, there's a label saying whose turn it is. So each node represents uh, like a complete state of the game. A description of everything there is to know about um, where the board pieces are and all of that stuff. Uh, and uh, the label is like, so in this there's three players, box, circle, and cloud. Okay, uh, so the nodes are labeled by whose turn it is to make a decision. Um, and each edge is a different move that they could make from that position in the game. Um, and I've drawn some dotted lines here to sort of indicate that like, it just keeps going like that forever and ever until you finally get to uh, a, uh, a state of the game where the game has finished. There are no more moves that the current player can make. Uh, and at that, I'll get to you in just a second, uh, at, that, at those leaf nodes, there is an assignment to each player of how happy they are that the game ended in that way. Okay, so uh, I've, I've drawn that here with, uh, there's a row for box, a row for circle, and a row for cloud, and there's just some numbers here saying how excited they are about the game ending there. Um, and I pick numbers from minus nine to nine. Uh, other, other games, uh, it's common to pick either zero or one, one for the winner and zero for everybody else, for example. Um, uh, but as long as they're sort of number-y things, you can do a lot. Yes? Just to bring some apparently heavy set theory into this, do you allow infinite games that don't necessarily have a limit? Um, okay. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, let's say we're only interested in finite games. Just to simplify, like just to avoid some really obnoxious, loopy things. Um, and there are plenty of games, even Go, for example, where technically it's actually not finite because there's situations where like, you can go back and forth capturing a single stone forever. Um, and there's various ways to get around that. Um, typically in Go, there's just a rule that you can't repeat a board position. Um, but like other things you can do when developing your AI is like have a stalemate situation where if you've seen the same position before, or you've gone a lot of moves without accomplishing anything interesting, where anything interesting depends on what the game is, uh, then you like cut it off and say that's the end of the game. So there's a couple ways to get around not having infiniteness uh, and still being able to do something cool. Um, okay. And the question we're trying to answer, once we're given one of these game trees, is which move should I pick at the top there uh, to like do the best? Um, where it's not super clear yet what the best should mean. Um, but the basic idea is we'd like an algorithm that takes a description of a game tree and tells us, picks one of these moves uh, to make for the current player, okay? So here's a quick little Haskell data type that um, captures the important parts of this. And we're going to come back to this type several times and sort of modify it and make it more um, complicated uh, a couple times. 
And here's the basic idea. Uh, you have a root of the tree, uh, which is uh, an M position. OK, so um, I am going to use a mutable data structure to represent the current position of the game uh, for reasons that are good, but which I don't want to tell you yet. And if I forget, please ask a question at the end about why. Um, uh, so the, the root is this root action. Think of M as being a monad here. So we're going to do some like initialization, allocating variables and uh, whatever, zeroing out arrays and whatever to, to set up the game. Uh, expand is a function which um, takes this mutable position description and produces the vector of moves that can be made. Uh, play uh, says, if you give me a, a mutable description and an immutable move, I'll uh, like modify the position description to incorporate that move. Um, and uh, evaluate is this thing that we were talking about before that says when we finally get to a, a leaf of this tree, um, tell me the score. And as, a, as an invariant, we will promise, uh, our, our search engine will promise that we don't call evaluate unless expand returns an empty vector. Okay? We could, we could like, make the type much more complicated and guarantee that at the type level, but it's actually not super useful to go to all that effort. Uh, you'll see why. Okay. So I would like to introduce you to Minimax. Uh, which is uh, an algorithm for deciding <coughs> which move to make. It is, uh, it's like the platonic ideal uh, tree search algorithm, the Ur search. It's a mathematician's first love. This is the search that other little baby searches wear their underwear over their pants because they think it makes them look like Minimax. It is simple, it's elegant. It's obviously correct, and it's utterly useless. So here's how it works. Uh, we're going to start at the leaves. We're going to work our way towards the root. Uh, at each node, whoever turn it is picks the move that's best for them. Iterate that, and you're done. And the outcome of this algorithm is a new game tree with more labels at each of the nodes. And the labels say, uh, roughly, like, what is the best worst case utility that that player can guarantee for themselves, no matter how adversarial their opponents try to be? Okay. Um, so let's do a quick illustration because uh, that description could be kind of vague and difficult to understand. Uh, so here we are. We're going to start at the uh, leftmost leaf here. Um, and for the purposes of this illustration, I'm going to pretend that these dotted arrows are like actually the end of the tree, just to keep it simple enough that we can do the whole thing. And um, uh, at this circle node, a circle has to make a choice between these three leaf nodes. And his utility in those three leaf nodes is 1, 5, and minus 6. Since 5 is the biggest number, He's going to make the move here that leads with, to him getting the best outcome of five. Uh, so we're going to record that that was the move we chose. And then we're going to propagate these scores back up. So uh, we'll mark inside the node that the outcome for each of the players is minus four, five, minus six. And that's just a copy of these scores. OK? Then we'll do that for the next node as well. So again, circle is going to choose 0 instead of minus 1. And then we copy these scores up here. And uh, at this point, uh, if you look carefully, we're in sort of a pickle. The original plan when I was cooking up this talk was not to bother talking about this pickle, because it's not super interesting. But I went to random.org to get my scores. And the scores it picked happened to introduce this pickle in exactly the right spot of where I would have done it if I were going to do it. And so I took that as a sign that we should talk about it. So here's the problem. Uh, cloud has to choose between 8, 8, minus 4, and minus 8. Clearly, these two are out. But there's no obvious reason to choose either of these for cloud, 8 or 8. And so what should you do? Well, it turns out it doesn't actually matter all that much. 
So we're going to pick an arbitrary rule for deciding which. Uh, um, oh yeah. So. Yep. We're going to pick an arbitrary rule for deciding which edge to mark as the one. And then for the scores, um, since the goal of the labeling is to be the best worst case utility for each player, each player is going to independently choose the worst score of the tied uh, possible outcomes. So um, here, Circle has to choose between four and five. And so he's going to assume that Cloud made the worst move for him. And Box has to choose between two and minus eight. And she's going to assume that Cloud made the worst move for her. So we get minus eight and four, even though there's no actual leaf node that has those scores. And then, uh, of course, we do that whole thing for, uh, for the last node. And then at the root, uh, now it's Box's turn to choose between these four possibilities. Choices are minus 4, 8, minus 8, and 5. 8 is the biggest one. So choose that edge and propagate the scores back. And, um, and this gives us the final tree that is the, um, sometimes called the policy. So this is the... Um, uh, the moves that a minimax player would play in all positions in this game tree. Okay, cool. So, now we're going to talk about what would happen if this algorithm didn't suck. But to do that, I have to tell you why it sucks, which I haven't told you yet. So far, it seems great. Alright, so, why does it suck? So I encourage you to code up minimax at home, teach it the rules of chess, and set it off running. And what is going to happen next is you're going to sit there drumming your fingers on the table and you're going to scratch your chin and then you're going to like start wondering, I wonder how long this is actually going to take to give me an answer of what the best first move in chess is. Uh, and you'll do some calculations and what you'll realize is that Minimax has to actually visit every single leaf node. And then you'll do some like back of the envelope calculations about how many leaf nodes there are in chess. And it's actually kind of a lot, like way more than you can ever visit all of them. Uh, and so we're going to have to do something to not have to visit all of the leaves. So here's the plan. We're going to descend into the tree a little bit. Not all the way to the leaves, just a little bit. And however deep we made it, we're going to make a guess about what Minimax would have said about the valuation of that node. And then we'll minimax our way back up to the root. Okay? Uh, and of course, like this doesn't actually solve the problem because making that guess is as hard as running minimax. So then we have to say, how do we like what algorithm do we use to make the guess? Um, okay. No problem. Here's the plan. Uh, instead of uh, computing exactly the right answer, we are going to um, take a trick from the physicists and chemists which have, who have taught us that uh, when you can't do an exact calculation, often doing a probabilistic calculation that has, <laughs> makes an estimate of the answer, and then like doing it really a lot of times uh, and averaging over the answer you get, actually gets you pretty close to the right answer. Uh, so we are going to construct a distribution over the leaves available from a particular node, sample from it, and use the average value that we get from those samples uh, as our guess of what Minimax would say about the valuation. Um, what, is, what does this distribution look like? Well, there's a lot of different choices, but a typical easy one to choose is uh, just at every time we have to make a move, choose uniformly at random from all possible moves uh, and play the game out all the way to the end. And that gives you a distribution on the leaf nodes. Uh, okay, and now I know there's some of you out there, maybe all of you who are thinking, come on, really? Like, <laughs> do we even learn anything from sampling from the node, the leaf nodes in this way? Uh, and so I have two answers to that. The first is I would like to remind you that our show of hands at the beginning was <laughs> essentially completely random. <laughs> Nevertheless, I actually did learn something about uh, which of you think that you're pretty confident about Minimax, which is like 
I witnessed that they were both sort of like half putting their hand down and half keeping it up, and like so maybe neither of them is really confident that they understand Minimax. So I learned something, not a lot, but something. Um, and and basically this is the the uh, the situation for playing games as well. Uh, if you get into um, a position that is more likely to win no matter what stupid things happen, uh, that's probably a little bit better than the position where you're likely to lose it when doing stupid things. Okay? Um, okay, so uh, that may, again, may have been vague enough that you don't totally understand it, so here's some Haskell code to make it concrete. Um, so I've highlighted the changes from last time. We are now no longer describing just a game, but also like some extra stuff that we need to have to be able to do the search. So I've changed it from game to MCTS parameters. And I've added this new field, which is for um, uh, selecting uh, a move given some options. And like a typical implementation of this, as I said, would be just choose uniformly at random from among all the moves in this vector. And again, we're going we're gonna to have an invariant that we promise only to call select on non-MD vectors so that this can actually return something. Okay. Um, and then the code to do one of these rollouts is actually relatively simple. So uh, we take some parameters, a description of the position. Um, we find out what all the moves possible are. If there's not any available, we just evaluate because we're at the end of the game. And if there are some moves available, then we pick one using the user supplied distribution, uh, play, out, play it in the current position, and then do a rollout for the rest of the game. OK? Nice and simple. OK. Um, and now for something slightly different. We'll tell you how to lose slowly in Vegas. But first, ah, yes, here's what I mean. <laughs> okay, so you walk up to Vegas, you've got $100 in your pocket that you're willing to completely throw away uh, because you know that if you had put $1,000 in your pocket, you would, at $100, lose your resolve and do the next 100 Terrible. But you're not an idiot, so you thought ahead. You only have $100 in your pocket, but you'd like to play for as long as you can before all of that money is gone. And there's a lot of slot machines lined up there. And you don't know, like, are they all equally terrible? Maybe one of them is a little bit better, and you could play longer if you picked the right one. So what do you do? Here are some bad strategies. One thing you could do is you could just sit down at, at pick a slot machine, sit down at it, and just play it until your money is gone. And the problem with this is, like, maybe you pick the worst one. Probably not. Probably you picked a merely mediocre one, but you'll only ever learn information about how terrible that one slot machine is. Um, another idea you might have once you realize the problems with this is you might go, okay, well, if I can't just sit at one, maybe I could just like multiplex my time between them. So just start playing each of them one at a time and go round robin, which is really good risk management because only, you know, if there's n machines, only one over n of your resources are spent on the worst machine. Um, and you actually get fairly good information, well, equally good information about each of the machines. On the other hand, you like never actually end up taking advantage of that knowledge. And so the flip side of it being good risk management is that it's really poor reward management because you only spend one over n of your resources on the best machine. Um, and so the thing that we'd like to do is make an algorithm that does better than this, okay? So here's a slightly more formal statement of the problem that we're trying to solve. So we have a collection of unknown distributions, d1 to dn, which like uh, in your mental model, think of these as slot machines. And uh, we're not going to assume we know very much. Uh, the only thing we're going to assume is that we know the maximum payout, basically. Okay? Um, and uh, we're going to repeatedly pick one of the distributions and sample from it. That gives us a collection of samples. Unknown to us, uh, t, distribution dt, is the actually best one, with mean mu t. And my regret is how much I lost out on by playing things that weren't 
distribution work slot machine T. Okay, so it's the expected difference between um, the the payout that I would get if I had just always done distribution T and the payout I actually get from uh, the strategy that I chose. Okay, and we'd like to construct an algorithm that minimizes regret. Okay, so here is the UCB1 algorithm. Um, the plan is that we're going to keep some statistics for each distribution. Uh, one statistic P and one statistic C for each of the distributions. P is the payout that we got by playing uh, that slot machine. It's the sum of all the uh, samples that we took. And um, and C is how many times we played each one. Yes? Why do we care about regret instead of just total payout? Um, okay, let's look at the formula. I think it's not interestingly different, except for maybe the sign, right? Because this is our total payout, total expected payout right here. Um, so maximizing regret or um, minimizing regret and maximizing payout are basically the same thing. Um, because, so this will be essentially, this term depends only on the number of times we played. Okay, so I think it's the same thing. Um, as for why people do it in terms of that one, maybe just because it seems uh, like that was a natural first choice rather than an elegant choice. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't it be that like the first lock machine that you play, you would have like a non-zero and everything else would have a zero, so like you would just do much more expensive that one because you wouldn't know what like the maximum payout you could get with it. Uh, it's true that you don't know the maximum payout, but you also don't know like there's no way of actually computing your regret. Yeah. So. I'm not sure that makes a big difference. Yeah. Uh, maybe you could explain in a moment what what a support distribution is. Oh yeah 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 maybe sure you're... sorry I, I used some jargon without even thinking about it. Uh, um, cool. So distributions, continuous distributions, are functions from uh, one domain to numbers such that like the integral is one. The support is the, um, the set of values where the function is non-zero. So all this is saying is that uh, we know that when we play the slot machine, when we put our $1 in, we're going to get something back out, some number of dollars back out that's between 0 and 1. So we're not going to get $2 out. We, we'll never win $2, and we'll never win uh, It'll never steal another 50 cents from us, or whatever. This is like the lightest assumption we can possibly make on a distribution, it is that the only thing we know about it is how wide it is. But we don't assume in particular that like it's normally distributed or uh, like Poisson distributed, or that we know anything at all about the shape of the distribution. Only that when we when we sample from it, we're going to get a number between zero and one. But, but so there's no like tails that go beyond zero and one. That's the are we assuming? Yes. Are we assuming also that each machine is capable of producing one? No. Okay, so the support is more in the codomain rather than range kind of regime. Uh, yes. 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 Okay. That's right. That's right. OK. Yeah, oh. you could have a machine that never gives you anything back. Could be. Maybe you never, ever get money back. Yep. All right. So we're going to keep, we're going to store uh, from our previous runs uh, how much we got from each machine and how many times we played it. And that's the only thing we're going to store. And then we are, uh, OK, uh, set C to be the sum of the counts for each of the machines, right? So that's the total number of times we've played at all. Uh, and then the algorithm for UCB1 is you select a distribution that maximizes P over P 
pi over ci plus the square root of 2 log c over ci. And if you are like me, you see that and you go, what the heck? What is that nonsense? Why is this the right answer? And there's a couple uh, different ways that we can tackle talking about why this is the right answer. Um, so I'm going to start with these two. The first one is I'm going to walk through the symbols and say what they mean and convince you that this has like sensible behavior, that like each of these has a meaning that is sensible. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit more about like the formal guarantees that we get out of this choice and, and where this choice came from. Okay. What do you mean by select the distribution? Uh, so the algorithm we are trying to write is one that tries to choose which distribution to sample from at each step. Okay. And the way it's going to work is by looking at the results of sampling the in the previous steps to decide which distribution to sample in this step. So I've, I've played slot machines 30 times. I'd like to know which of the machines that I've played so far I should play next. Okay, so this PI over CI, that is the average payout for that machine. That's sort of my guess about how good that machine is. Why is it play all each of them at once? Yes. Start by playing them each once. Definitely. Um, yeah, otherwise this denominator is pretty bad, right? Yeah. Okay, so this is like given the current information, our sort of best guess about how good that machine is. And to begin with, it's going to be an absolute trash guess, but it's a guess. Uh, and then this term is, uh, in some ways, the more interesting one. And what's going on with this term is um, uh, the goal of this term is to um, encourage you to explore machines that haven't been the best in the past, but which you don't know much information about. And the way it does that is um, the denominator only increases when you play the machine. So as you play it, you are disincentivizing further play on that machine. And the numerator increases no matter what you play, which means that as you play more, you are further incentivizing playing, those, playing that machine. So this is incentivizing you to play machines that you haven't played very much in the past. And, okay, like, cool, I get it. Like, you want to play machines that did well. You want to play machines that you're not sure about. But there's a lot of functions you could write that sort of have some kind of behavior like that. And why is it a square root? Why is there a natural log? What is this 2 doing? Like... There's so much trash in that thing. All right, so I am not going to try to explain the full der derivation of this. Um, where it comes from is a calculation about um, the, um, so you can construct a confidence interval uh, around the mean, which is um, like, oh, I'm 95% sure that the actual uh, expected payout of this machine is in this range given the samples I've seen so far. And this thing is related to the upper end of that confidence bound. So you're, you're picking the machine where the upper end of the confidence bound is as high as possible. Um, all right. So here's some, uh, some nice properties of that formula. Uh, so like I said, the, the second half of that thing was the one-sided confidence interval. Um, one of the things you can prove about this is that it chooses the best distribution exponentially more often than any other distribution in the long run. So we're talking law of large numbers kind of thing here, right? So maybe to begin with, it does a terrible job, but eventually it gets the right answer exponentially often. Um, the, uh, the total regret after m selections is O of log m. And it turns out that you can prove that this is asymptotically optimal amount of regret. Uh, now, you cannot prove that this is like, so keep in mind big O is hiding constants and stuff. 
And you can actually find bounds that have better constants. This is sort of well known, but they're so much more complicated that the extra cost of computing the more exciting thing is actually not worth it in most cases. So most people use this nice simple one. Okay. So now I'd like to connect this question back to the uh, situation that we're actually trying to solve, which is searching game trees. So here's the situation that I am in. I have spent a whole bunch of computational time like descending some way into the game tree and doing rollouts to decide uh, how good the nodes at the fringe of my search are. And now I d discover that I haven't yet been asked what move to make, and I have more time to think. And I would like to decide which of the leaf nodes should I spend more time thinking about. And so this looks a bit like the problem we were describing before, where I have a bunch of slot machines, where I have some unknown payout of each, and, uh, and I'd like to try again playing the one that I think is either best or that I still need more information about to decide whether it's good or not. So this is the, the thing that we're going to do to decide which node to search more from. We're going to start at the root. Um, at each position, we have a choice between some number of moves, and we're going to use the UCB1 algorithm to choose. UCB1 is the, the is this thing. Um, uh, so we're going to use UCB1 to decide which of the children to go to, and uh, we're going to repeat that until we find a node that we haven't, that has some children we haven't searched yet, uh, and then we will do a rollout from there. So here's some code that reifies that idea. Sorry. Yep. But you're you're exploring a tree, like each. I'm a little confused by that because I mean the um, slot machines was like a flat distribution. Yeah, yeah. We have to we have to run the flat distribution many times. So this algorithm uses the the flat distribution decision function many times. Once for each each time we descend a level in the tree. There are other ways you can do it, but that is a pretty standard one. So at the root, we have whatever, maybe four moves that we're choosing between. And we keep statistics about how many times we've looked at each of those nodes and how good they were in each, of, each time we looked at them. So you apply the same sampling at each level. At each level. And then once we've chosen a, a, a move to make from the root, then at that node, now there's some moves where we again have statistics about how many times we've descended and what the payouts were for each of the children. And we use UCB1 at that level, then we descend and we use UCB1, and so on. Okay, so uh, here's a replication of that. Um, our parameters now have to distinguish between uh, statistics and scores, okay? So statistics is this data structure that stores information about uh, payouts and counts. Payouts are the scores, basically. Um, and so our evaluation function for the leaf nodes now returns a data structure that, to begin with, has one in the count field, okay? Uh, and, um, uh, but it has to also keep track of the payouts for all of the players, uh, which we weren't doing before. Maybe we should have been, actually. Let me think of it. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. We are now. Um, uh, and it has a score function, which may at first look like a bit of a strange type. So let me explain this a little bit. Um, so um, it takes two copies of these statistics data structures. And the reason it does that is because you need one for the parent node and one for the child node. Because if you recall uh, here, we needed to do set C equal the sum of all the CJs. At the child node, we have only CI, and so we can't compute this sum. But at the parent, the total number of visits to the parent is actually the sum of all the visits to all of the children. So we're going to take the, uh, the counts at the parent, 
the counts of the child and the values for each of the players of the child. And the reason we take a move is so that the, the move information can tell which player is the one making the decision right now. So that we can use that to pick out the, the right payout field. All right. Um, and uh, we're finally ready to introduce our data type for storing uh, the search tree, the information about the search tree. And so here it is. We have uh, some statistics. We have a, a map which says all of the children uh, for each possible move, uh, what the search tree looks like there, and uh, a description of what, uh, what moves we haven't thought about yet at all. And uh, here is the logic for doing this thing that I said where we're going to descend using UCB1 at each step. Okay, so we take our, we, we take our parameters, a description of the position, uh, a search tree, and we're gonna produce, uh, for technical reasons, it turns out to be convenient to report the statistics that we computed at the leaf node uh, and, um, and the updated tree. And the way it works, there's gonna be two cases, so there's one more slide on this. Um, the first case is when we have touched each of the children at least once, so there's no nodes left that are unexplored. Uh, in that case, I'd like you to look now down here at the where clause. Um, we're going to pick the child that maximizes the score, and here this score function comes from our parameters and typically would be calling uh, UCB1 as the function to compute. Um, and uh, so we, we pick out the child that's biggest. Uh, if there isn't such a child, that means we're already at a leaf node. We're like at the end of the game. Uh, so we just uh, evaluate the current position and return it and we're done. Um, if, there are, uh, if there are children, then the one that's best, we play it. We um, run Monte Carlo tree search on the subtree. And then we update our statistics to take into account uh, the new, the extra, um, extra payout and extra uh, plays. Okay. Oh yeah, and, and we should update the, the right child, the, the child to have the new tree. Okay, yeah, yeah. anyway. On the other hand, uh, if there are unexplored nodes, then we should explore one of them. Doesn't matter which, really. So we just play one of the moves, uh, do a rollout, and uh, return the statistics. So this is sort of the base case of this recursion. Um, yes. And, uh, and then we remove it from our list of unexplored things. OK. Cool. So at this point, I'd like to recap briefly what we've accomplished. Um, so what we've described here is actually, in my opinion, something that sounds like a pretty sensible description of like how to play a game. You spend some time thinking about a couple early moves, look at how good it feels to be in the position that those moves lead to, and then pick the one that leads to the best position. Um, but there are a couple things that are still really unfortunate about um, like the way that humans play games has a couple more pieces in it that aren't captured by this algorithm. So uh, there's two that I want to talk about. The first is that there are positions that humans consider obvious. So let me say what I mean by that. I don't mean there's an obvious move to play. I mean the, position, the value of the position is clear. So if you, this is a game, uh, this is a uh, Go board, and uh, hopefully some of you play Go and can connect with this, but if you don't, don't worry, I have some chess examples as well. Um, and if you show this to a Go expert, they're going to spend only a couple seconds looking at this, and at the end of that seconds, they're going to go, heck yes, black is in good shape. And the reason for that is that Go is a game about capturing territory with your stones. And roughly speaking, black has territory, a gigantic territory here. And even if white were to like be given 
all of the things that he could possibly want on the board without interference from black. The only places he would get are like a little bit here and a little bit here. Um, and they're just way smaller in total than this. And so you don't have to do a detailed analysis where you like try to figure out the exact end state of the game to know that this is really good for black. You can have a gut feeling for that. Um, and th so the second piece, the first piece is that there are obvious positions where the, the judgment of the value of the board is very easy. And there's also obvious moves where the decision about what moves to think about is very easy. So again, if you show a Go expert this position, um, they're going to like instantly look here. And the reason for that is because this move uh, captures a black group and capturing is generally a good thing. And it prevents a white group from being captured if black were to play. So this is sort of a dual purpose move that does quite a lot. And maybe if you gave them a long time to think, eventually they would start like looking at a couple other moves, maybe one here or one like up there. But the point here is that they're going to focus on just a very few of the possible moves, even though there's 26 open intersections on this position that you could play in, they're really only thinking about one or two at a time. Okay, uh, and uh, I'll give you an example from chess as well in case that connects more with you. So if you show a chess expert this position, uh, there's really only one move that they're going to be thinking about, but let me describe the problem that, uh, that white is in if it's white's turn. So this is called a fork. This pawn is threatening to capture either the knight or the rook here. And either one you move, the pawn is happy to catch the other one. Um, but an expert will go like, aha, I see. If I move the rook here, then the, um, the black player can't move the pawn because that would put his king in check. And so there's really only one move that an expert would be thinking about, even though there's actually 24 legal moves on this board. What about the other? Yeah. Um, and uh, Monte Carlo tree search, as I've described it so far, doesn't really have an answer for these two concepts. It doesn't have a way to bake in, uh, like, um, like when you run it, you start with a really low quality evaluation of a particular position, right? It's just, how did we come up with that evaluation? We like played random moves and then figured that's probably the right answer. It's really bad. And, uh, and any single additional rollout only improves it a tiny bit. Um, and, uh, and like none of the rollout games are actually like look like typical games that you would see. And so convergence of this algorithm is very, very slow. And uh, so one of the key insights that the AlphaGo folks had about this was like, what if we spent just a tiny bit more time, but got a much better answer to those two questions? So uh, this is weird trick number three. Uh, we use a deep convolutional neural net. Okay, okay. So I said at the beginning, there's no, there's a there's a core algorithm that's solid computer science. This is the computer art part. Okay. Um, uh, and the the neural net's job is you feed it a description of the current game position, and it is supposed to spit out a like halfway decent guess about the evaluation of how good that note is for each player and uh, like a halfway decent guess about what moves people would consider playing or players would consider playing. Um, and you use that to fix the, the, the two problems that I had before. So now uh, your initial estimate, okay, it's not perfect. It's the output of a neural net that we don't fully understand. Uh, but remember, the baseline that we're trying to do better than is a completely random uh, first guess. Well, not completely random, but pretty random first guess. And when we do a rollout, instead of choosing moves uniformly at random, we now choose them according to a distribution that favors 
moves that you would expect to see from good players. Okay? Uh, and all of that is lovely and great, except it's a neural net, and so it needs training data, and so the obvious question is like, how the heck do we teach it what positions are good and what moves players would actually make? And the answer to that is sort of incestuous. You train it by playing it on MCTS without the neural net, uh, and then you get a like halfway decent neural net, and then you train it on MCTS using that neural net, and you get a slightly better neural net, and then you train it on MCTS using a better neural net. Yeah, okay, cool. Are there public game databases that you could just spray? Um, uh, yes, so that's a great question. Um, there are, so for like chess and Go, there are fairly large-ish game databases. Um, and, uh, and the like original AlphaGo started with a neural net trained on top uh, pro human play. But one of the things they discovered is that in terms of neural net training data corpuses, that corpus is actually relatively small. And the other is they really wanted to have a story for um, being able to deploy this thing on basically anything without human experts having to first understand everything there is to understand about that domain. And they really wanted an algorithm that didn't necessarily need human input. And so uh, Alpha Zero, which was their next iteration, um, started with just pure MCTS. And it turns out um, this actually happens to be pretty good. Uh, like their, uh, their Alpha Zero made, well, so it's not completely scientific. They changed like three or four different things about it. But one of the things they changed was they stopped using human data. And, um, and it's after like two days of training, uh, it was beating the Alpha Go implementation that had done uh, 150 days of training uh, 80% of the time. So that's pretty good. Um, and one of the things they discovered, actually, it, it's especially interesting for the Go people in particular, not for like machine learning experts, but for the Go people in particular, one of the things they discovered is that, um, so there's a, a handful, what Chess calls an opening book, and Go is called Joseki. It's like uh, first, a, a collection of like first moves that everybody agrees is basically equal for both players. And so you'll often see them at the beginning of the game. So there's like, there's four corners and you'll see, you'll probably see one of these Joseki in each of the four corners. And it's like a, a sequence, a set sequence of moves that everybody agrees is good. And what they discovered is the neural nets actually rediscovered these. And they uh, additionally invent a few of their own that uh, actually stand up to pro analysis after the fact. So uh, pros have started playing some of the Joseki invented by uh, Alpha Zero, which is, Pretty cool. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, here's my uh, less vague Haskell implementation on that. Okay, I haven't done it yet. <laughs> I don't understand this part fully yet, so I can't explain it. Go. Uh, what, are, what are the inputs and what are the labels that they're training in that net? Is it they have to like small, like three by three and nine by nine boards and help them just the next position? So the input is a complete description of the game. And we can talk about like the, the actual internal representation of that description. So for Go in particular, if you're interested, the way it works is uh, they're doing, so like I said, they're doing convolutional neural nets. I don't know if you know what that means, but part of what that means is that the input data has to have a concept of like geometry and nearness. And so the way that they achieve that is um, there's a whole bunch of different layers. Each layer is a 19 by 19 grid that describes the whole board. And it's, uh, it's like uh, there's ones where there's a white piece and zeros everywhere else for the first layer. And then ones where there's a black piece and zeros everywhere else for the next layer. And then there's, there's more layers describing previous moves to account for the fact that there's this thing called co that I was describing before where you can like go back and forth capturing one stone wherever. Uh, you want to have some history information when you're making strategic decisions. Um, so that's the input. Uh, so like uh, a, an analog for chess, for those of you into chess, uh, again, you have uh, an eight by eight grid and you have a bunch of different eight by eight grids that are sort of, uh, and then, so the first layer is 
Uh, there's ones where there's white pawns and zeros everywhere else. The next one is ones where there's white bishops and zeros everywhere else. Then ones where there's white rooks and zeros everywhere else. Ones where there's white, que white queens and zeros everywhere else and so on. So this is how they capture the information about the board. Um, and then the output, uh, so uh, the output for Go and for chess and for other standard-ish two-player abstract games is the probability that black will win. And uh, the, uh, the output, there's a second output which is um, like a weighting on how how good it thinks each move is. So for chess, this would be like, for each pair of positions, how likely is it that the Monte Carlo tree search algorithm would choose that one as the move to make? Okay. I don't know how to tell you how to do these. Uh, maybe at a future meetup. Cool. Uh, so that's pretty much all of the technical content that I wanted to cover. Um, I hope that uh, I hope that at this moment the feeling that you have in your heart is like, is that it? <laughs> because this is my opinion about like how you should view Monte Carlo tree search. It's like a very simple core algorithm. It's sort of obvious what decision to make at each step. Um, it's, it's nice and simple. But if that's not the feeling you have in your heart, if you have some questions that you'd like to ask me, now would be a fantastic time. Yes? Um, I was just thinking about the part where it trains itself against an MCTS. Like, huh? um, is, there some, is there some sort of like trade-off that can tell you how many GPU hours give you work for the acceleration? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Um, you said like two days of training, and I was like thinking, well, if they use like six times as many computers, two days. Is oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the training... The training is on uh, Google scale hardware, so uh, it's uh, hundreds of TPUs and uh, hundreds, tens of CPUs. I think most of the most of the like advantage that you get from training for them comes from TPUs. Um, so yeah, it's like uh, millions of dollars worth of compute time. Um, uh, as for like how to choose how long to train before swapping that in and uh, like doing a new thing, I think the way that they solve that problem is by basically doing um, just always swapping it in as soon as the neural net is better than the previous one. So they have three things running in parallel. Uh, thing one is training the neural net on training data. Thing two is uh, evaluate the most recently produced neural net against the last one that we thought was good. And if you beat it 10% of the, t like, if you beat it 60% of the time, then you make that be the one that you, uh, was the last one you thought was good. Um, I don't remember the exact number. It might be 75% or something. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Um, and then the third thing that's running is... Uh, create new training data using whatever we think is the current best neural net plugged into MCTS. And so that's just ongoing, that process. Swap it in when it can. Is there really just like three machines, or is it testing oh, no. like a zillion in parallel? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything's enormous in parallel. Yeah. Oh, wait. This doesn't mean, has anybody actually done this? I mean, you can train a model in like 10 minutes. Like 10 cents um, GCP hardware. It's very complex as to now. I agree with you, like, whenever that happened. I, but I don't the think they're happened. unaware of how to train. Maybe not to be, <laughs> not, not to be Go or you know, be the best player at Go, but the basics, like, it's got to the point where it feels like Ruby on Rails. So, like, 2005, 2006, spin up your own web framework was actually kind of complicated. It got to the point where there are, like, you know, uh, this is the best framework, you know, so set it up and Get started with uh, machine learning in like 10 minutes. So it has got to that point, it doesn't take like a million dollars with the beta just credits in order to like do your own training. I uh, hope that doesn't like, dissuade anybody or support this question. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think, uh, yeah. So 
I guess part of the point that you're trying to make is like not all machine learning problems need as much training time as AlphaGo did, which is certainly true. Uh, I think by now, because enough other entities have replicated this work, uh, we have pretty good confidence that like 10 minutes is not enough for this problem domain. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's uh, there's an open source implementation now for uh, called Leela Zero, and uh, they basically did a folding at home kind of thing and asked people to donate their GPU for training, uh, and it like it really wasn't good until they got quite a lot of compute time uh, under their belt. Um, but okay, so uh, I would like to also give you a little demo. I I, I walked you through an implementation in basically four slides, uh, which is something that I built. And then uh, that took probably six hours to write and debug and get right. And then it took me the next 34 hours out of my 40 hours of uh, uh, time on this to uh, implement the part that says like how to make moves and stuff. Uh, so, but I, I implemented this for my personal favorite game, Dr. Mario. I know that not all of you will know how Dr. Mario works, so I have pulled up a little video here to show you uh, a little sample of gameplay. This is some very handsome fellow playing. Uh, and the way the game works is um, you, uh, the play field has these viruses on it, and uh, you are given control of a pill and it's a bit like Tetris in that you can like move it left and right, rotate it, and move it, drop it down onto the board. And the way that you make progress is if four things line up next to each other, horizontally or vertically, of the same color, they disappear off the board. And the goal is to make all the viruses disappear off the board. So here's uh, a quick example of me playing. Um, you can see when I make a four there, it disappears. And Basically, I'm just trying to line up colors horizontally or vertically over and over. Um, now that you have seen some of the basic rules, got a sort of a feel for it. Um, oh, I just want to watch a second longer. I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> Look at this combo. This is. I'm just so proud of that. Okay, cool. <laughs> Does it go for 42 minutes? Just. Uh, yes, so I this is my current um, personal best speed run of playing levels 0 through 20. Uh, the world record is about 25% faster, so I have a long way to go. Uh, while I was speaking, in the background, I had uh, my implementation running, thinking about uh, a first position of a random board that you know, picked at random. Um, so this has been running for about an hour. Uh, you can see some stats at the top. It's like, what is that, 3 million rollouts at this point. Um, it's, it's running at 600 rollouts per second right now, which is, probably means there's a bug that has caused it to crash, because under normal circumstances, it's somewhere between two and 5,000 rollouts per second. Um, I think the sort of folklore is that if you're not hitting 10,000 rollouts per second, your thing isn't fast enough to do well. But. <laughs> this was just for fun. Um, and uh, I would like you to mentally take a guess about how many moves in the future this thing is thinking about having hit 3 million rollouts. And uh, to say what I mean by move, like there's the way this is coded up is there's like two phases. There's a player phase and a, 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 a like adversary phase. And the player phase is given a pill, decide where to put it. And the adversary phase is like randomly select a pill. Um, so I, I'm asking like pick a number of player phases that it's thinking. Okay, and then I will uh, pause execution so that it doesn't like do something weird while I'm exploring. And uh, we can explore the game tree. So this is uh, basically the root of the tree. This is actually the children of the root. So this is, uh, we can move left and right to see all of the different places. And you can see um, the value here at the bottom is um, uh, the, the mean uh, outcome by some arcane uh, evaluation metric. 
Uh, and this number tells how many rollouts it's done for each of the positions. So you can see that it spent a lot more time on this one because it thinks it's much better. Um, and uh, so I'm just going to descend down the leftmost branch of this tree, which is the most, uh, the highest value each time. Go. Is is this actually out of an adversarial game? No. Okay. So you're. So, uh, so the way that I've dealt with this problem is to say that the, uh, the payouts for the random moves are all the same. And so when it's doing the search, it evenly selects between all possible moves in the adversarial phase. Okay. There's six, are there six different codes? Nine, actually. Uh, because, so there's six, like, meaningfully strategically different ones, but it, it the the distribution uh, is oh. weighted more heavily towards Got it. Uh, the ones that are sort of doubles. So uh, yeah, so if I scroll left, you can see like almost all of these have exactly the same number of rollouts. Yeah, they're all different by at most one. Uh, so this is, uh, hopefully that's evidence that you think I did the right thing about the adversarial phase. Um, Okay, so we've done, this is our second player phase, third player phase, fourth player phase, and at that point we basically haven't thought at all. So it's basically thinking four moves ahead after an hour and a half of thinking, which is pretty, pretty trash. Uh, <laughs> like, it's not doing a good job of thinking ahead at all at the moment. And so the fact that it manages to do anything sensible under those constraints, I think is pretty wild. Um, but yeah, so I also give uh, a demo of it playing some games. Uh, unless you have further questions about this tree, I'm about to throw it away, and that's an hour and a half of compute time, so if you have questions, you should say so quickly. Three, two, one, go. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, so we'll just do, let's see, uh, what, what did I call it? I happen to know that uh, level 17, number four, is an especially fun one to watch. So this is a replay of, um, of the, the AI given, uh, I think this is 60 seconds to think about each move. Completely unreasonable in terms of like the game itself. Normally you have to make, uh, you have maybe uh, a third or a half of a second to decide before you're in control of the pill. But okay, so let's just find out how well it did. Uh, and uh, this will be pretty much the end of uh, all the content I have prepared for you. So, yes. So, do they all get faster? I imagine is there some point where um, I mean, I guess in early stages you can basically pick where you want your piece to go, but in the, like in the later game yep. when it speeds all the way up, is there a, you have to, like do you have to do a different strategy where you have to like, pick the best one due to like momentum and cycle and such? Totally. Uh, yeah. So. At the moment, I haven't implemented like careful tracking of the speed that stuff drops and that and time management stuff. Uh, but that is something that eventually I'd like to have in the model of how the game works. Um, but yeah, that's a thing that this algorithm should be able to support without too much trouble. Um, the main thing is like, what positions can I actually put the pill in? And sometimes there's fewer, and then that makes the search easier. So it does better. Have you seen, uh, how are the bindings for like any of the uh, like frameworks? I haven't looked yet. I'd love to know if uh, if all y'all have done some modern ML stuff in Haskell, which thing I should be looking at. But uh, I think it's actually, it, like, actually wouldn't be that bad to have a serialization and deserialization phase if only maybe Python or whatever has good bindings. Uh, it has, uh, PyTorch has uh, C++ bindings. Yeah. Well, but, yeah. It would really be nice if I didn't keep thinking of OCaml every single time to talk about machine learning. My oh, phone yes. This one. Yes. What makes people better or worse at Dr. Mario is? Look <laughs> ahead, or is it like pattern recognition and speed? I think a lot of it is pattern recognition, which is why I was hopeful that I'd be able to do something good eventually when I incorporate the machine learning bits of this. Um, but 
generally, the thing that you want to be doing is making sure that both halves of the pill that you're given are making progress towards something. So that there's basically like two things that you're paying attention to. That's one. And the other is leaving your board in a state that has something useful for all the possible pills. So like in situations where you have a choice between clearing this red part and that red part, if this one makes yellow available and you don't have yellow anywhere else, that's a higher priority. So those two factors, um, making sure that the current pill both halves are useful and in the future, having a plan for what to do with all possible upcoming pills are the things that you're sort of thinking about a lot during the game. Yeah? Is this your first kind of line? Uh, yes, you can get a copy of this and run it. It's on, uh, I don't know if I included a link in this. Uh, I guess I didn't, but so let's get it up here. GitHub.com, Dimwit, Nurse Sveta is what I'm calling it. Uh, so Dr. Mario prescribes the pills. Nurse Sveta tells them where to go. So um, one day is this thing going to do your speedrun for you? This is going to one day tell me how I can get better at speedrunning. Because I'm going to feed it in the game that I actually played, and it's going to say, well, this move was absolute trash. <laughs> and you should be thinking about this other move over here instead. Maybe you can wire it directly into your fingers so you can have a, you know, can realistically call yourself a speedrunner. <laughs> yeah, uh, so you laugh, but I actually do have a vision. This is like, uh, okay, so I have to explain that like, in my mind, the, the thing that I'm working on here is like a 10 year project that I spread over whatever, a couple hours each weekend. So this is very long term and the most vaporware possible. But eventually what I'd like, there's a two player mode of Dr. Mario. And uh, eventually what I'd like is to be able to like have a, a little Arduino that has wires in the right shape to plug into an NES port and uh, a, like an input for AV that I can get from a splitter from my NES and uh, have it like basically be a controller, except instead of putting you know, controller inputs, it puts uh, the inputs that needed to do to make the moves my AI picks. And I think I sort of know like what engineering pieces have to be done to do that. So um, eventually we'll get there. Yes. Is there like an existing tool that says a speed run of it? And like Dr. Mario? Just there is a, there is an amazing tool assisted speed run of just the final level. Under normal circumstances, the tool assisted speedruns are supposed to follow the same rules as human human done speedruns. So they have like uh, like normally you would have to play zero through twenty the whole thing. Uh, but well, let me just show you and you'll see why. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. How the heck am I supposed to find this? Uh, I wonder if this is good enough. Um, yeah, it looks like such. I don't know if this is the right one. Yeah, this is the right one. Okay, cool. Um, by control, I'll destroy it. Yes. Uh, it looks like, so there's like a glitch here. That's not an actual NES glitch. That's just a video encoding glitch. Um, and so the majority of the beginning of this is going to be like setup that looks absolutely trash. Like it, this doesn't make any sense. Um, oh and... Okay, so it, like it's really good at combos. Cool, cool. Yeah, we're gonna, and all of this is just like clearing out space to begin the real work. <laughs> Where's your implementation of GPU accelerating? No, not yet. I wanna get there. And now all of a sudden, it makes a lot less sense what's happening, like strategically. Like you see this yellow red pill? It seems like there would have been a really great spot for it, right? Why didn't we go there? Answer. Uh, oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns out they discovered uh, a bug where if you do, um, if the, so the, the NES doesn't have multiplication in its ALU, and so to do multiplication, you have to do repeated addition. Well, you don't have to, but this is the way that uh, Dr. Mario does it. 
And for the score, the score is supposed to increase exponentially with the number of viruses that you clear with a single pill. So like if a single pill drops uh, and you clear n viruses, you're supposed to get like two to the n points. And they discovered that uh, you can make the counter take longer to update than one frame refresh, and the thing goes absolutely bonkers if you do that. Uh, so, um, so if you clear enough viruses uh, at once, then uh, you just win the level. And they decided, you know, just showing it on one level is good enough to realize that we could probably do that on all the other levels. It's not, not really fun to watch that happen 20 times. Once it's enough. So this task doesn't follow the rules. Um, I do not expect my AI to discover this bug. <laughs> hey, your, your YouTube recommendation looks like mine. <laughs> uh, cool. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, for the Monte Carlo, Carlo tree search. So like, would it deal with like uh, like local maxima, like well? Like if you had one one move that looks really well, but then like in another worse spot, it yeah. eventually finds a better score. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a pretty well known problem, and I think there's even a fancy name for it in the reinforcement learning arc. Uh, literature. Um, and in fact, I told you uh, when AlphaGo played Lee Sedol, it was a complete wipeout. But I didn't tell you the whole truth. Out of the five game match, there was one that Lee Sedol won. And in this game, Lee Sedol made an unbelievable move in the middle of the game. Everybody, the pros, Lee Sedol, the, the, like, the engine itself, <laughs> estimated that the engine was way ahead. And we say, don't make this brilliant move. And the AI went nuts. I didn't understand. And, and so what it did was um, he had basically started a chain of moves which would capture a large group. And our best guess about what happened was it was looking far enough ahead to see that a large group would get captured. Um, and what it was doing was finding moves that would push that capture one move deeper rather than doing something good so that it looked like to the search that capture wasn't going to happen. Uh, yeah, which is really unfortunate. So it made a whole bunch of like really dumb looking moves that just delayed the inevitable. And then when it couldn't find a move that would push the capture past its search uh, limit, then it finally resigned, and that was the end of the game. Um, uh, yeah, and... Um, so wait, so what made this move brilliant? <sighs> what made it brilliant was that it was very complicated. It made, um, it made the analysis of the position very difficult. So in a lot of Go positions, like I said, there's only a few moves that experts are actually looking at. But what he found was a move that split the like search space in a complicated way so that you had to look at a lot of moves now and you had to look at a lot of moves on the next step and a lot of moves on the next step so that the, like, uh, the pro neural nets and the AI neural nets both had trouble deciding like what was going to be the outcome of this move. Is that a sort of move that's also desirable against human players? When you're losing. <laughs> if you're winning, you don't want to make it uncertain what's going to happen. But if you're losing, it's very exciting if you can make it uncertain because then you might not be losing anymore. <laughs> 